time for us to begin this afternoon. If you're visiting with us, thank you for being here with us. I uh, hope you've enjoyed your day. Uh, we're blessed this afternoon to have Randy and Sharon back with us. Randy's going to report on some of the work that he didn't get to report on whenever he was here three or four weeks ago. Uh, and he's going to bring us up to date on some things that's going on with the Pacific Broadcast Network. So when his time gets around, he will uh, enlighten us some more. We had a productive meeting with him this afternoon about some upcoming things. I know that he's going to share some of that uh, with you this afternoon. Just a few announcements. Nothing's changed from this morning, but uh, remember next this coming Wednesday night we'll have snacks with Santa downstairs in the basement after our midweek study. Uh, there'll be a New Year's fellowship, New Year's Eve fellowship at the McAtee's. If you have any questions, uh, see Jeremy or uh, Andrea on that. Our card ministry downstairs tonight after our services. Uh, remember that. Uh, one thing, if you remember a couple of weeks ago with the tornadoes that went through the area, uh, this congregation spent uh, sent $5,200 to the Bread of Life ministry that uh, is based and assisting with uh, cleanup and, and things like that, devastation that went on. So uh, you are to be commended for that. But if you'd like to make any other personal contributions to do to that, if you will... Uh, uh, just if you want to just write a check and just earmark that for the bread of life, and we'll make sure that that gets funded the way that it is. Uh, those that are on our sick list, uh, Alice is dealing with some uh, bronchitis. John Barker uh, is doing a little bit better. I think what Rhonda uh, Angie had texted her earlier this afternoon that he doing just a little better. So remember him. Uh, as Dennis mentioned this morning, Beverly's mother is at home. Uh, doing somewhat better, and maybe Beverly will get to come home later in the week from where they've been uh, been caring for her. Rick Holden has a procedure tomorrow. Uh, remember him, uh, Carol and Steve Cookson. Both of them are struggling with COVID and pneumonia. Uh, Janet Langley, uh, Jane Brooks, uh, who had back surgery, and uh, Merle Ann, and then Doris's niece uh, is dealing with COVID. Well, if there's nothing else, uh, Elijah's ready to lead us in our worship this afternoon. And again, thank you for being here. Start with number 253 tonight, 253, and then we'll have our opening prayer. Oh, it's okay. Two, five, three. Looks like we're going to have to get our songbooks out. We'll sing all verses. How shall the young secure their hearts and guard their lives from sin? Thy word the choicest rules imparts to keep the conscience clean, to keep the 
conscience clean. Tis like the sun a heavenly light that guides us all the day. And through the dangers of the night, a lamp to lead our way. A lamp to lead our way. Thy word is everlasting truth. How pure is every page. That holy book shall guide our youth and well support our age. And well support our age. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Lord, we are thankful that we can come and praise Thee, sing songs of love, and we ask You be with those that are less fortunate, especially those in Kentucky, lost their homes, lost loved ones. I ask that You may be with them and help them to restore and get back their lives. We know there was lots of damage done and pray for those that again that lost their lives and as you go with us through this day, this night, and let us be mindful all blessing come from thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sing a couple of songs here before we have our lesson. <clears throat> Prince of Peace. Um, we'll sing we'll sing verses one, three, and four of this one. One, three, and four. <clears throat> Prince of Peace, control my will. Bid this struggling heart be still. Bid my fears and doubting cease. Hush my spirit into peace. May thy will, not mine, be done. May thy will and mine be one. You chase these doubts. Now thy perfect peace impart, Savior, at thy feet I fall. Thou my life, my God, my all, let thy happy servant be. Sing 647. Let's be standing for this song. <clears throat> Sing this song, and then Randy will have our lesson. <clears throat> so I'm trying to get my picture here. Um... Forgot to say the verse, we'll sing one, two, and four. Since the love of God has shed priceless blessings on my head, I have made it my own. I will hide it in my heart that it never may depart. It shall rule there alone. The love of God within the heart 
will kindly nest and warmth impart. The soul will glow like Jesus in his tender mercy. If the heart is made his dwelling place, the love of God within the heart flame. Through endless years it is the same. The love of God will never fail nor lose its glory till we see him face to face. He who gave his love to me that I might from sin be free bids me share it today. As I love you, he has said, you must serve men in my stead as you go on your way. The love of God within the heart will kindly nest and warmth impart. The soul will glow like Jesus in his tender mercy. If the heart is made his dwelling place, the love of God glows like a flame. Through endless years it is the same. The love of God will never fail nor lose its glory till we see him face to face. While his love burns true and bright, we are walking in the light he has shown us the road. We his glory must reflect as our dimness and neglect keeps some soul from its God. The love of God within the heart will kindly nest and warmth impart. The soul will glow like Jesus in his tender mercy. If the heart is made his dwelling place, the love of God goes like a flame. Through endless years it is the same. The love of God will never fail nor lose its glory till we see him face to face. <clears throat> Be seated. The invitation song, should you want to mark it in your books, will be 351 351. I want to thank our brother for leading the singing tonight. Uh, you do a very good job, and I appreciate that very much. It's really strengthening to see a man uh, stand up and be able to lead singing and to be able to do such a job. And I know he's probably not a day over 30 years old, is he? <laughs> Tell you what, he's knocking it out. Uh, that's got Pacific Islands written all over it. If he can lead singing like that. I'll never forget the time that one of my co-workers, Brother Robert Martin, he's been a missionary for, I think, near to 50 years now, but he and I were in the country of Tuvalu, and we were taking the gospel there. It was our first time in that country, and we'd been working all week, and we came to the Lord's Day, and we uh, we were going to have a worship service among ourselves, and uh, we didn't have a place to worship other than where we were staying, and it came time to lead singing. And Brother Martin, uh, you uh, you must sing. He definitely sings with the Spirit, and uh, but he has a difficult time, you know, being on tune. I mean, I have a rough time, but he has a real difficult time. And so that, that morning in that small little place in Funafuti, Tuvalu, uh, there were islanders uh, around us nearby. Of course, they were too shy to actually come in. We had our worship service, and uh, I led singing, but Brother Martin sings a lot louder than I do. 
And boy, I'm telling you what, that was an amazing day. And finally, after the singing got started and underway, I noticed then people began to come in. And I think it was because they heard us trying to sing is what it was, that we needed some help. But God got us through all of that, and it was a beautiful beginning to a, a wonderful disposition at present day. The church meets in Funifuti Tavalo. It's a self-supporting church of Christ. Uh, there are a good number of members, even though the country only numbers 10,000 people. And uh, you want to look that up maybe sometimes on the map when you have the opportunity. It's a very small country. Those are Polynesian people. And uh, it wasn't long after that. In fact, on that very first trip, we had baptized a man by the name of Palau Kofi, very faithful man to this very day, and a wonderful man. And his wife, Susie, came a little bit later uh, after we later went on another trip to the country. And I'll never forget Susie Kofi, uh, Palau's wife. It was late one evening when we had finished Bible studies. We could tell that Susie was uh, affected in some way. We just, we knew something was going on, and we could tell. And after the Bible lesson was over, she came up and very quietly said, I have wasted my life not being a Christian, and I want to become a Christian right now. And so we gathered together with a group. We were meeting at that time at one of the local schools. They gave us the use of the building and we all gathered together and walked out to the seaside. And this was nighttime. It was very dark outside. And the tide had gone out. And you know, when you're near the ocean and the tide goes out, the water is very shallow for a long way. And you have to work, unless there's a hole somewhere that you can get in, you have to work to find a place deep enough to baptize someone. And so we walked out in the water. And it was a, a nice moonlit night, but nonetheless dark. And we walked and we walked and we walked out in the ocean. And finally we got to a place that was deep enough that we could baptize Susie Kofi. That's K-O-F-E. And I imagine if you were to Google her husband's name and her up, you would read something about them becoming Christians. But that was a beautiful day. And that couple uh, together worked diligently and still to this day to help the Lord's church to grow and to spread the gospel among their island. They're just a beautiful couple. And that evening, I tell you, we were all just awestruck by uh, her obedience to the gospel. We were way out in the water and everybody else was standing on the shoreline and Susie uh, began to cry. And I thought, well, my goodness. Uh, I said, Susie, uh, I know this must be a, a wonderful time. She said, yes, Brother English. I said, is there is there something wrong? And we're way out in the water and we finally got up to about, you know, the knees up here, a little above and she said, well, no, she said, but, but there are sharks swimming everywhere around us in the water. And I'm telling you what, I looked and there were sharks in the water around us swimming. And I, I knew that we were going to get eaten right then and there. <laughs> but we made it out of there uh, without getting bit. I'm grateful to the elders uh, for giving us the time tonight to come back to you. Um, I'm thankful there's somebody up in the control booth up there, and I have a controller, uh, to be able to share with you something from the Word of God, but also our uh, work in God's work through Pacific Broadcast. And I hope this will encourage you, because this congregation, what you see tonight, the congregation here at Green Forest has been a part of helping to build this network. And as I was sharing with your elders this evening and Brother Jerry, it's an amazing thing to see how God will bless the hands of His people when we put forth a very dedicated, diligent effort and we hold true what God's principles are and what the mission of the church is. You know, Pacific Broadcast is... Uh, a tool, and that's that we respect that for what it is. It's just a tool. It is not the gospel, but it is a tool 
truly to broadcast the gospel. It's doing that plus a whole lot more. And tonight I want to share that with you, and I want to show you that there are some opportunities within that kind of work to put talents to work. You know, the entire network is built upon a 100% volunteer basis. I want you to keep that in mind tonight, that even my own efforts in Pacific Broadcast and my wife is volunteer. This was never put upon us in the work description for the Pacific Islands mission work. The idea of having a radio station came years after we entered the work. And I asked our elders, after speaking to a brother by the name of FM, just like FM Radio, his name was FM Perry, and he lived just outside of Nashville. And I want to mention this because Brother Perry had written an article, and I believe it was in the Christian Chronicle. And I was on the way out of our home in American Samoa and on my way to the Solomon Islands. And we had a Christian Chronicle sitting by the door. And I grabbed that newspaper because I wanted something to read on the flight. And I turned through the pages of the Christian Chronicle. And I'm not for sure exactly what date it was, but I'm sure we could Google that up and find it. But he wrote an article expressing how he believed that the church should be involved in things that will broadcast the gospel. You know, the very nature of the gospel teaches us it is something that needs to be broadcast. Now, I'm not referring to radio necessarily or TV, but you know, just as we read in the scriptures about the seed sower, he broadcast seed. He scattered the seed. And so the gospel is truly just like that. It is given to be broadcast and be spread. In fact, it's it's very effective when we do that. That was God's idea, His mind about how we can share the gospel with other people. And the ideology behind that is just amazing. You know, if you scatter the seed, then you know that some of the seed is going to come up. And that seed that comes up, you begin to nurture it and help it to grow. And so... From the standard, from the viewpoint of the gospel, when we think about how to get the gospel out and we think about broadcasting it, we think about different tools. You and I are a tool or a vessel to broadcast the gospel. How do we do that? With everyone that's in the room tonight, when we all just do a little bit, we make a little bit of an effort in terms of helping someone to know who God is or what God desires to do in changing their life, we are broadcasting the gospel. And so it was God's plan, you know, of course, from the very beginning. That's the way the New Testament church would be propagated, is through His people, through His vessels, through these tools. Well, you fast forward to our day and age, and we have this great tool uh, known in broadcasting as radio. Uh, today, a more common term is streaming. And in short, it's just a way to get a beautiful message, a life-changing message into the hearts and minds of men and women everywhere. I am amazed at how many people there are among us who really are desiring to change something about their lives. It is absolutely astounding. When I speak to people just every day, out in public, uh, on the phone, one of the first things I'm interested in is about what they are wanting to try to change in their life. And that's not the first question that you get to with someone. But, you know, you begin to talk with them and find out uh, what they're doing. And, and then as you go along, you can find out that there are some things that they want to change. And, you know, basically when I talk to someone about wanting to change some parts of my life, I'm basically admitting that I have a shortcoming. That I, that I would really like to try to overcome. And so it's a very personable thing as you and I go forward and we talk to people and we learn that, that they really are interested in changing. And as we have the opportunity to talk to people about that, that's where we can bring God into that picture. And we can give them hope. I saw a sign coming over here that the sign just said, Optimism. You might have seen it. It's a billboard, and it talked about that positivity of being uh, an optimist. 
And, you know, I think that we can give people hope with the gospel just like that. We can assure them because we know that God can change lives. But I've also learned this, that it doesn't happen just by osmosis, that we cannot sacrifice clarity for courtesy, that we have to help people to know what to do. And it's a really fickle thing because we don't know when someone is ready to listen and someone is wanting to tune out. And so we try different methods and we do different things. We meet up with a friend we haven't seen and we try to strive to bring God into picture. And because we love the Lord Jesus Christ, we try in as much as possible to walk after Him and to live our life like that. You're a kind person. I try to be kind, but you know, I'm not always kind. I, I'm a miserable failure sometimes, but I have God who's willing to forgive me. You know, the Bible says that, that we are perfect people. How is that so? Well, we are perfected through the blood of Christ. I literally cannot be perfect, as you cannot. Uh, I know some who I think of as almost perfect people, but you know, the Bible teaches us that we can be perfected by the blood of Christ. And I love that thought, and I love to share that kind of thinking with other individuals because they get it. And so we're able to take this beautiful message and to people both far and near, both people in the United States and our culture here, and of course people in the Pacific Islands. Several years ago, after reading that article by Brother F.M. Perry, in the Christian Chronicle, as he was advocating that the church should take a more active involvement in things that were broadcasting the gospel. He was proposing that the message really needs to be put out on a bigger scale. While we can speak to 50 people, why not speak to 500 or maybe even 5,000? What would be the result of the gospel if truly you had 5,000 people who were listening intently? Can you imagine what would happen? And so he built his case in that article for it. I was struck by that message that he shared in that article, and it bothered me. I was on a flight into a remote area of the world, and I knew I had a long journey in front of me, but it absolutely consumed my mind the entire trip. And even at times when I was in rough waters and in areas where we were in the village and much by ourselves. I thought about that word being broadcast, the gospel being broadcast. It bothered me. And so when I returned back to American Samoa, even though we can't dial one plus like you can here between states, I found a way to contact this man named F.M. Perry. What I found was a very kind hearted, older, faithful Christian man. F.M. Perry was a retired engineer. In fact, he was a radio engineer. And I told him that I had an interest in radio broadcast. In fact, we were doing some radio broadcasting, but not through our own stations. It was paid uh, through stations. We would buy airtime and broadcast sermons and messages. And so as I began to talk to him, he said, well, you know, Brother English, I've, I've just got to tell you, uh, he knew where I was and we worked all that out. He said, I will do anything within my abilities to help you to broadcast the gospel. And I said, well, you mean like a radio station, for example? He said, we can get that done. We can do that. And he spoke with a surety, though he was humble, he spoke with great authority. And he would begin to help introduce to me the way that that could take place. It wasn't too long after that that I began to speak to congregations, just like the members here at Green Forest, and to tell them what we wanted to do. First, I had to speak to our elders and get their permission as it was. That was not in our work plan. And yet they knew this was going to be a big responsibility, not only financially, but of time. But they agreed to let me do this, to take the forward steps. And they said, as long as you keep your work responsibilities up to going into the different nations and preaching and teaching, we have absolutely uh, no mind against this. 
and we will encourage you and help you. And they did. And so we set out on applying through a lot of paperwork through the FCC for our very first radio station license. It took several uh, months to do that. It's a rather complicated process. We were uh, quick to find out that we could have that done for about $5,000. That's what it cost to go to a consulting firm and have them to apply for an FM license. But, you know, we had Brother FM Perry, a great man, a very knowledgeable man, and he showed me step by step how to do that. And we submitted that application. A long story short, we received a letter back from the FCC saying, we're happy to inform you that your application for a license for KULA has been granted. The word KULA in the Samoan language is like a lay, and it means welcome. That's what the, the word means. There's a city in the state of Hawaii named KULA, Kula. They have called me no less than four times asking if we would be willing to give up our call letters <laughs> for a station that they want to do there. But we were so very thankful to hear that the FCC agreed with us and they issued that very first license. Later, we would find out that as we begin to do this work together with the church, that God blessed that effort and began to turn it into something beautiful. The Apostle Paul, in the book of Acts chapter 28, came across a very special group of people. The Bible tells us about Paul having been shipwrecked in chapter 27 and previously his journey. And that is an epic tale, if there ever were one. There probably would be no greater Bible story directly out of the Bible to read to maybe a group of younger people or children, than the story about Paul being on that ship and what happened. I have read that even to my own children. And I recall at different times our boys' eyes growing as big as marbles when they would hear the story about Paul being on the ocean. Well, you know what happened. In chapter 27, it explains to us that they did wreck. They had a wreck and the ship came apart and he told the men on there, if you don't do certain things, you know, you will be lost in this. You will be saved if you do this. And then as we come into chapter 28 and verse 1, Paul is there at Malta having been shipwrecked. And I want you to notice what he says about these people that he encountered. Acts 28 beginning in verse 1. Now when they had escaped, they then found out that the island was called Malta. Verse 2, And the islanders showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. The Apostle Paul was introduced to a group of people, yea, islanders, some translations call them natives, and he identified them with something that we can definitely identify with. He called their kindness unusual. He said they were unusually kind. I've thought an awful lot about that, and especially after going and living and working in the Pacific and doing things like broadcasting the gospel. I've thought about these kind, unusually kind people, and it's very true that the islanders that we labor among are unusually kind. It's not to say that they cannot be unkind. Many times they can be unkind to one another. Right now in the Solomon Islands, you know, a few years ago we had a civil war, and many people got killed, and I'm here to tell you tonight that that has flashed back up again. And there are some terrible things happening. But these are, generally speaking, these are unusually kind people. Paul saw it. We see it. And he thought it important for those who were with him and others. Everywhere he went, he thought it important to be able to help them to know who God was and to know the gospel. The Apostle Paul encourages us then. Brother F.M. Perry encouraged us to take a hold of a work that will help to get the gospel out, literally, to millions of people. And I want to share something with you tonight about that very thing, 
I'll ask you to, if you can, to just direct your attention to the uh, screen in front of you tonight. I want to share with you about Pacific Broadcast Network. It is a work, as it says to us, it's a work of members of the Church of Christ. It's not a work of brother and sister English, but it is a work of us together. There is no possible way that without, for example, Brother F.M. Perry, that this would have happened. There's no possible way without the efforts of the congregation, even right here at Green Forest, that Pacific Broadcast can do right now what it is doing. And there's members in this room who I personally know probably still have red paint on a pair of blue jeans or a shirt or a scar mark from getting skint up from working out with us at Pacific Broadcast and doing things that equate to helping to build this broadcast stronger. I want to share with you how that takes place. This is on a very practical level. And our goal is sowing the seed of the kingdom. Pacific Broadcast Network basically is designed to approach three ethnic groups of people. I want to make sure that I'm hitting. Do I need to point this head on? Right, right there where you are? Ah, okay. I did that without doing anything. You must have done that. <laughs> so it really is part of what we call a comprehensive approach to the gospel. You know, these are all tools that in front of you there on the screen. Tools help us to get the gospel out. We can do that through having personal fellowship with people or through TV or Bible training courses. We have the Pacific Islands Bible College. You can look that up online and, and see how that functions. You can actually even enroll in that Bible college and take the courses online. But those things are working in the Pacific. There's radio. There's also Several platforms on the internet, the web, Instagram, Facebook, texting, email, and there, of course, is going. I made mention tonight to the elders that in all that we try to do with this work, it's still coupled together with going, literally going. You cannot forsake that. And so it's an integral part of sharing that everlasting gospel that you and I have obeyed. Pacific Broadcast is currently has grown to eight separate FM license. That constitutes five full stations and three translator stations. It also has the webcast. It does have growing in its social media because those are the ways that we're more readily able to reach people today. There's been a lot of studies done about reaching people. And the question on the table is, do you reach more people through radio? Or do you reach more people through streaming? Well, I can honestly answer that question from the viewpoint of several cultures. In areas where we work in the Pacific, we know without a shadow of a doubt it's greater through radio. But we see, as we have for years, that the web is coming on strong. In the United States, many people are streamcasting, and we believe that's good. It doesn't matter to us if we get the message out an antenna or through a server. The point is, you want people to be able to hear the gospel, to understand it, to know the way that they need to go in order to change their lives. And so that's what Pacific Broadcast is doing. We are working to do that very thing with Pacific Broadcast. It starts at our home base in American Samoa. And this is where we were asked to move to in 1989, to begin to make our home there, have our family there. And as the years went on and we began to work in this country, we saw an opportunity uh, through Brother F.M. Perry to be able to start a radio station. Now, American Samoa is a very interesting place. It's well over 90% Samoan people, in fact, more. It's not a very big country. It's only 60,000 people. But I want you to look at how mountainous that country is. It's just incredible. It's, you, you cannot walk from one side to the other because you can't climb that high of a mountain. You'd have to have a helicopter. But it was a place that was really lacking in radio. And certainly, the gospel was not being broadcast in that way. And so, because it's a, an American territory, the Federal Communications Commission has charge over what is broadcast, the stations that operate there. The other countries in the Pacific... 
for the most part, do not. There's a few that are in association with the U.S., but American Samoa is a U.S. territory. So if you want to broadcast there, you've got to ask permission from the United States federal government. And we did that through applying. And, of course, the great result was that they did issue that license. The island that we live on is called Tutuila. And that map shows the heaviest populated areas uh, that's in the entire country. Now, those round circle dots represent where we have stations in the country and how they're broadcasting. For example, those uh, blue dots down at the bottom, that's where our primary studios are located in the country. But those yellow dots are at the top of the highest peaks in the country. And those are translators. And so the FCC later came back and said, you know what, if you will apply to it, we will grant it. It's most likely that we'll grant it. You can apply for a series of translator stations. And what you do, you take KULA and you broadcast on that and send it to the first translator. And then that translator sends it to the second one and the second one to the third one. And they just daisy chain and all of a sudden you're able to cover that entire region. Well, they granted those licenses and we went on to build that network. That was the beginning of a network. We have towers there that were located on just like you would here in America. We have our own programming being produced, of course, with ourselves and with local people, Pacific Islanders. We uh, quickly realized that broadcasting from our bedroom or from our office was not going to work. I'll never forget broadcasting from downstairs, a room that we had in our house, and we were live on the air, and there was a chicken uh, that used to jump up in the coconut tree quite frequently, and when he did, or she did, she would let out the biggest yell that you ever heard. And so there we were, live on the air with sunlight in the Pacific, a radio Bible program, and about halfway through it, when all of a sudden you heard this chicken just yelling at the top of its <laughs> voice. And so we decided that it was time. Brethren in Chattanooga, Tennessee, designed a facility for us that would withstand the cyclones, and they did a great job of it. We had teams that came and helped us to build this together with the local brethren in the country, and we put up a small, it's not a very big place, but it's sufficient for the radio station to operate. As time went along, there was another opportunity in the country to have a full power station. This would be a station that would not only cover American Samoa, but would jump out to other countries. And we applied. That, again, was a lengthy process, but it was made easier because we had done it before. The FCC granted us that license at 88.1, and we <laughs> refer to that today even still as KGIF, and that's an acronym for Keeping God in Families. The broadcasting through KGIF is all about families. That's the whole pointed target of it. Each of the stations have different types of broadcasts. KULA says it on the tagline. It's information plus inspiration. So it's 24-hour-a-day programming, but it also is uh, in addition to having the sermons and the Bible lessons and the a cappella singing. We have an information network there. We have a lot of programming that's done by Christians in different areas of uh, work. For example, a doctor or a factory worker or a farmer. There's all different types of backgrounds in there coming to people in the public. And so this was a design of the radio stations. A few years went by and the FCC opened another opportunity and we applied for KIOE. The word IOE in the Samoan language means yes. It's sort of like an emphatic yes. It's Y-E-S exclamation mark. And so we took the call letters K-I-O-E with a tagline saying yes to God. When the Samoans saw K-I-O-E, they were familiar that radio station generally started in that area of the world with the letter K. And they knew what the word oi meant. It meant yes, and so that was a big help to us. And so we at that point had seen that God had blessed this broadcast to grow. 
It was reaching a good number of people. It was beginning to get to the point where we couldn't necessarily, we could not handle all of the work that was being done at that location. After meeting with our elders and talking with other brethren and getting input, we decided to open the facility in the United States that we would build and purchase. And we did that at what's known as Gaither Mountain. This is an area where some of the members here at Green Forest have come and worked together with us. And so the facility at Gaither Mountain helped to bring us into an entirely, really an entire different broadcasting circle. It would take what we were doing with these stations that we had at this point, and it would consolidate them more where we could do the entire work from this particular facility. It was a lot of land and one building. And so we got to work and began to construct the facilities there that were needed. We had a team of guys, three guys to be precise, that showed up on site. I did the dozer work of leveling it. Uh, we had an old D6 dozer with an angle blade on it. And I got on that thing and learned how to operate a dozer and level the land. Three men showed up and came out with chainsaws, basically. That's what they had, chainsaws. And they built this building right here. This would be a technical building for us. Its long-term plan was a shop and then a technical operation building. And they built this in just a matter of days. It's not a real expensive building, but it certainly suffices well for us. We had another team of Christians that came in and they helped us to install the power that Pacific Broadcast needed to run transmitters and to run the facilities with the different buildings in it. And that was three-phase utility power. Times when the power goes out, just a couple days ago, it went out on us and everything shut down for just a few seconds. Not every building's tied onto it, but we were able to go up in northern Missouri and purchase a backup generator for the broadcast project. So that was installed in its permanent home to help us to offset some of the energy costs to spin that meter backwards. We began to develop some alternate energies. We are not a taxable organization, so we weren't interested in tax credits. What we were interested in is things that we could do ourselves that would provide energy for us. And so solar was the first answer to that equation. Solar power uh, is hardly, there's hardly any real maintenance that you have to do to keep it operating properly. And you know, you can do it one of two ways. You can feed battery backup systems. We have those, but we're not utilizing that. Or you can go directly to the grid with it. And basically, you know, if you're using uh, 100 units of electricity, it will turn that back to maybe 50 units. And that's a simplified look at how the solar converts into reduced energy cost. We're not uh, in the alternate energies business, but we wanted a way to offset our costs. We knew that broadcasting required equipment that uses a lot of power. Here's some, just some shots of a volunteer team that came out. This was a growth step for us. We needed communications and a good communications network. We were using a Cat 5 and Cat 6 cable, buried cable from building to building, but we had a limit. But with fiber optic, we could go miles and miles and never lose any of the data. And so we installed fiber optics with this 2,000-foot uh, roll of cable, and the group came out. We worked for four or five days, installed that fiber optics in every building at Pacific Broadcast. Now, one of the things that we run into at this 39-acre site, it's not 40, it was 40, but the previous owners donated an acre to the cemetery. So we have a cemetery. Uh, do you all remember the cemetery on the corner out there? Yeah, right on the corner. We had a work team that came from Atlanta, Georgia one time and had several young men with us, and uh, they were always pulling tricks on me. So we decided one night to uh, tell them a story about the cemetery. And uh, I'll tell you, they didn't pull tricks on us anymore <laughs> after that. <laughs> well, you have to keep up the properties. 
And I'm sharing this with you because sometimes when you hear radio work, I wonder what's in your mind. I ask that question a lot of people. Well, what do you think the civic broadcast here? After maybe reading the report, and you get all kinds of answers because people may not have been there. Or you're thinking radio, that's right. They're thinking broadcast, that's really good. But sometimes they don't know of the day in and day out things that are associated with operating such a facility. Well, that's part of it right there. You know, you've got to do something with that grass. You're either going to mow it down or you're going to cut it and bale it for hay. And so we have everything from this type of work, which is definitely needed, and of course equipment to do it, and all the way up to the more complex. To us, it does not matter. It's work that needs to be done, and it's all important work. It's part of maintaining a facility that God, and a work that God has blessed us to have. People oftentimes will ask the question about Pacific Broadcast, well, where in the world is it taking the gospel? I mean, where is the gospel being broadcast to? And I want to share with you for just a few minutes about that. First and foremost, its target group is in the remote Pacific. And when I notice I say remote Pacific, because when we say the Pacific, it's a huge area. It covers just from the west coast of California all the way back over to uh, well, India and all the areas in between. And it goes far up north and far down south. So the broadcast project area is really the entire Pacific Atlantic. Now to reach that is just a logistical nightmare. It takes a lot of broadcasting to do that. The very best way to do it would be satellite. If we had a satellite, it just rain down on that region of the world, we'd have it. But we don't have that, and we don't quite understand how to put one up in the air. So we have three air Yes, sir. The mic. Is it dead? It's not on. It's not. It must have went off on me. But let's try it again. And so it is difficult to try to reach these areas in the Pacific. Thank you. And also in the United States of America. We initially didn't set out to broadcast to America. But when we outgrew the Pacific in our production facilities and came back into the U.S., we thought, well, we're here and we're doing this type of production work. There's people that are coming and staying with us and recording. Why not put it on the air here in America? And the first answer to that question is we got stopped at the front door of ABC or CBS or NBC affiliates because of the cost. The cost of programming is just prohibited for the amount of broadcasting that we do or would want to do. So the answer to the solution, since we have people like yourselves who are helping us to provide the labor and the input is to go ahead and build the station ourselves and operate the station. Then we've got it 24 hours a day. And so we decided to do that, to not only go in the Pacific, but into America, and yes, even into all the world. That step, that last step into all the world, is something that has really started to come to fruition in the past 18 months more than ever before. Tonight I spent a few minutes talking with your elders about the totality of the network. There's the terrestrial part of it that goes up a tower and out on an antenna and into your car or maybe your home radio. But there's another part of it that is streamed, and that part of it is the one that literally goes all over the earth. If you can find your way over to a website, Pacific Islands Bible College, you'll see a Bible college that my coworker heads up. It's something that we work in regularly. And a few years ago at a meeting, he said, you know, Brother English, we're really uh, growing in the Pacific. We have 2,600 enrolled students in this, what would be a three- to four-year program. And he said, but we're ready because we have taken everything digital. We have all of our instruction now on video, and we would like to offer it to people everywhere. And he put that question out to me and asked us, how can we do that? 
Well, we're working together with him to do that through the audio side. But we talked to him about what he could do, and he got that help and took Pacific Broadcasts into a streaming world. In the moment that they turned those servers on, by the end of the next day, the student load almost doubled. And it's just unbelievable when you sell shoes and you sell them in Poplar Bluff, Missouri, and then you begin selling them all over the world. What happens? And this goes back to exactly what Brother F. Helm Perry said, that we need to be broadcasting the gospel. When Pacific Islands Bible College turned that server on and began to offer that teaching through that program, it was amazing the level of growth. And we know from experience that's the very same thing that is happening to Pacific Broadcast. And so recently, we began to move into that realm. We started by purchasing our own servers. Why would we do that? Well, think about it. With five different broadcasts, how much do you think it would cost if you took one of those 24 hours a day and went to a service bureau company and said, we'd like to hire you to stream for us 24 hours a day? You know what the first question would be? We'll base that price on the number of people that hit that stream. If 100 people hit it every day, this is our charge. If 500 hit it, this is our charge, and it just goes on and on. They scale that. That's the way you pay for these streaming activities. We're doing things to be successful. Our goal is to have thousands of people streaming. But the budget, I want you to think about that for one radio station, what it would cost. It's incredible. And so we turned back inward again. We began to order the things that were needed for us to go into the realm of broadcasting the gospel, streaming it online through our own servers. And we're engaged in that right at this very moment. We have equipment that we're operating and working to push up to the point to serve up those daily streams. And to do so, and to do that effectively, we need people that can help with that. Generally, when you look out into an audience of people, you find a different age group, and what we have found is what we're finding everywhere, that it's the middle age on back downward to the younger ones that really are engaged in the ability to do this kind of IT work. But for us to do that, we have to have the other group that serves for the infrastructure to build out Pacific Broadcast. And again, remember, we're doing this on a volunteer basis, and we're doing it on very limited budget. And so we can ask the question about PBN's signal. Where is the gospel going? It's going first and foremost into the Pacific, secondly into America. And I shared some insight this evening with the elders. If it were up to us, we would be putting it into every corner of the U.S. And we may be close to doing that now. We are not only going out the towers with the terrestrial broadcast now, we have been for years, but now we're reaching out with the gospel even through webcasting and streaming. And that is something that we're about to launch in a much larger way. Now, one of the things that we have been doing in the past 18 months because of something spelled C-O-V-I-D, it whether you agree with what's happening or not, let me tell you what it has done for us. They shut down every single flight in and out of our home for the past 30 years in March of last year. Our home that we built with our own hands, I can't get in the front door. I don't know about you, but I've never left my home for 18 months unattended, i thinking I'm going to have more Psalm 1s in that house than I can possibly move out if and when I ever get home. <laughs> but nonetheless, the government in its wisdom believed that it was best to shut down the flights and they remained shut down. The American Samoa government would maintain that if they stopped traffic in and out of the country, there would be no COVID, there would be no sickness. They had some reasoning behind it 
that was known as the Spanish flu of a long time ago. It struck the Samoan Islands. They lost a big percentage of their population. And so this is the approach they have taken. They did flinch temporarily to start doing what they were calling repatriation. That's citizens only. If you could prove your citizenship, you could begin the process of getting back into the country. After that, they said, we'll open it up commercially. Ever since I've been there, we've had three flights, two to three flights per week. In the summers, they may move that up. They've had one flight to two per month. It's next to impossible to get on a plane. The ships don't go there because we don't have that kind of tourism. It's, it's getting difficult. Imagine a broadcast of this kind of size and you being separated from it for a long period of time. Imagine, what could you do with that? Could you control it or will it control you? The house, we got, we let it go. We, in our minds, you cannot worry about it. We've never been the kind of people who have said, oh, we're afraid to go here, but someone will break into the house. Sharon knows exactly the shutdown procedures and the bring up procedures when we walk out the door to go in another country or to come to you. And we did that when we left the country with a plan to come back just a few months later, but that didn't happen. And so, by the end of March of last year, we were in meetings with our elders. We knew that we were not going to be allowed to go back. We're used to going into different countries every few weeks, just like the work that you sent us to do in 89, but what would we do now? And we decided, together with our elders, to turn our work right back into Pacific Broadcast, there at Gaither Mountain. Everything was loaded toward labor hours, manpower hours. There's only one problem. At this point, early in the game, where there was a lot of uh, disease spreading and COVID and such, the teams, they could no longer come to us. We've been accustomed at Pacific Broadcast to have teams in from three to four people to 20 people. And can you imagine the labor input to such an organization? But it died quickly. We didn't ask the people to come because we knew we would be infringing on them when it was difficult for you to even meet together and many other people. We saw a sign on the Donovan building this morning on our drive over here. And I caught a glimpse of it as I was starting to slow down coming in Don and it said online only the Donovan Church, and many others like that. And so we were faced with the difficulty of trying to continue a network that has grown to be the largest radio broadcast network in our brotherhood today because of God blessing it. And faced with it that we can't even get back in where our main control systems are. We're operating remotely, and here we are at Pacific Broadcast. So together with our elders, the decision was made to turn it right back in. Every effort that we had, we couldn't get back out on the field to labor efforts with Pacific Broadcast. We immediately began to take on projects that were not scheduled until later the next year and even into 2022. So it helped us to ramp up what we were planning to do out there with Pacific Broadcast. And it brought to a grinding halt being able to get in to the other countries. It's just not possible. You just can't go in. That is now beginning to change a little bit. But one of the things it showed us was able to build through Pacific Broadcast and the weaknesses of what we had built. The weaknesses showed up in about 180 days. The strengths were there from the beginning, and we worked with those. But as we begin to see the weaknesses, we knew that we would make an effort to change that. And that's what I want to tell you right now as we're getting near to the end of this report. We had not the labor that we were used to to do the physical things that are needed for that kind of facility. You know, there's a lot. You know, you got to cut hay, you got to paint a door, you got to install a broken window, you have to work on a heat and air, you've got to
that you need to bring in another power line to another bill, and it just goes on and on and on. But those things uh, had to be put by the wayside, and we had to prioritize what Sharon and I and maybe uh, our children as they would come and visit could do. And then we begin addressing the technical side of Pacific Broadcast. And so it was all about labor and nothing about equipment, but about labor. What could we do with what? God blessed us immensely in that. But we did find out where we were shy. And so we're addressing that now. We're increasing our efforts in the terrestrial part. We're trying to... uh, uh, to work under a plan right now, we're actually already started in it, where we will obtain a 140-foot tower. That's a that's a big commercial-grade tower. And volunteers with Pacific Broadcast, members of the church, will build the foundation for that and will install that from beginning to end. The cost of that installation alone was minimal at $24,000, minimal to just put it up. But because we have a good volunteer team, which included some of you all, we can put that up at zero installation cost to us. That will help us to strengthen our terrestrial broadcasting, that is, out antennas and out into the world, and to get this message broadcast in the way it should. But we not only were addressing it from the terrestrial standpoint, we've been working now for a good amount of months toward the streaming side. We've been taking and recreating lessons that were prepared for web distribution. We've assembled some equipment to take that analog signal and digitize it. This congregation about three years helped to introduce us to the world known as AIOP, audio over IP or audio over internet. And so now instead of that big heavy thick black cable times 100, we have one Ethernet cable. And Green Forest helped us to make that happen. When you walk into our studios, that, that's what you see is audio over IP. So it helped to launch us into really a different type of work ethic with this broadcast, this worldwide broadcast. Now, what we're proposing is to strengthen our infrastructure to purchase this tower, to install it ourselves, this tower alone is about $30,000. That sounds like a lot of money. Just around the corner, you've got a tower that looks about like it. That was a quarter of a million for the cost of the tower and almost that much to install it. So we, we can see that God is blessing us with opportunities and now that the teams are beginning to show back up, The labor is there once again. Our desire also is to stream this message into every home and car and every phone and uh, area that we can. And we can do that through the streaming mechanisms. And we're just a short distance from that. We're going to be able to take this uh, analog signal and to convert that signal and to push it out as a stream and to push it out to our own servers. There again is another catch for us. We can prepare the signal, we can digitize it, but if we send it to a service bureau, we're talking a high monthly rate. That's why we've invested time in building our own servers. And so what we have before us right now is a tower that's about $30,000, and we have about $20,000 in equipment, peripheral equipment for that broadcast network. As we put that together and totaled it up, it was about $51,000. That sounds like a lot of money, and that is a lot of money. It was $5 each for our children to be born at the LBJ hospital. $51,000 is a lot of money. But $12,000 of it has already showed up, and that's even in under 30 days. And so we're making an effort. We're certain that we're going to be able to get back home and be in the position that we need to be to continue to do this good work. We need people who can say, you know, I'm not sure how you can use the help, but I'm willing to give the help. And then we take it from there. We're beginning to schedule teams in 2022 in all different facets of the work, including the technical side and the construction side and the maintenance side and and the equipment. And we're sure by doing this that we will continue the good work.
We will continue ensuring that many, many more people are hearing the daily broadcast that's being put through Pacific Broadcast Network. And so it is. You and I, we preach and teach the gospel. We do not worry about the increase because we believe and we know from His Word that God will give the increase. Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, but who gave the increase? God. And so we can do that work. We can reach people who are right around the corner from us, and we can reach people in the Middle East, in North Africa, and in the European continent, and yes, even in the Pacific. Because we're moving our work into a new realm. And we can do this with your help. We want to thank the congregation at Green Forest for what you have done in the work. We want to encourage you to keep up with the work to the extent that you can. We do have a, a publication that we share with what's going on every month. And it's entitled Sunlight in the Pacific. This happens to be a year-end report that just gives a snapshot of what happened over the past 12 months. I entitled an article, 2021, A Year of Difficult Roads That Led to Beautiful Destinations. And I believe that's a good description of what God has done at Pacific Broadcast. We've got a lot to do, a lot more to do. And I'm sure that God will bless us to do it. We want to share with you what is going on, the work that is being accomplished together. It's not being accomplished by one family or ten families. It's being accomplished because it is, as the banner said, it is a work of the churches of Christ. We do not have a board overseeing our work. We have an eldership that oversees our work. That's the way Pacific Broadcast works. And to this very day, I still volunteer my time and effort, just like you have, in the work at Pacific Broadcast. I have to admit that it is getting a, a heavy, a heavier, heavier load. But look what God did. He, through the circumstances, providentially blessed us to be able to have more time that was needed to work at Pacific Broadcast, and He gave it to us. And so we're very grateful for that. We know that could not have helped, uh, could not have happened without your help. You know, it'd be like all dressed up and no place to go. If we had had the time, but we didn't have the things, the tools that we needed to work. And we got ahead of schedule. In fact, we got so far ahead of schedule that we grew into the year 2022 without being there. We want to encourage you to find a way to help. We are confident that God will provide what's needed in that work through His people. And we'll be the first ones to volunteer to be there and to do that. And I want to thank you for your good attention tonight. Pacific Broadcast is something that you can be thinking and praying of just as much as we can because you've helped to make it happen. This congregation is probably in a lot of ways closer than many others because you helped at an important pivotal point to help move us into a different realm. And that's the realm ultimately where we want to go. We want to broadcast the gospel. And the effective way to do that is to have a good broadcast and then put it into the minds and hearts of people. We really don't care how it is that we reach them, but we have a responsibility to that. You know, things do sort of hinder us. Uh, a cost is constantly a factor. Uh, manpower is a factor. But you know what? God has given us everything that we can handle and then some. And so I want to thank you. I want to thank you for giving me a few minutes tonight to come and explain something to you that we couldn't possibly write about so that you will know this congregation knows more at this point about what's happening in Pacific Broadcast than perhaps many others. But we're working hard to try to help people to know what is going on. Every inch of it is overseen by our elders and that they oversee our work. If it's a dollar that's given or if it's $500 or if it's 50000 that goes directly to the eldership at Forest Park. They receive all the funds for our work. Your accountant here at the congregation, as Green Forest supports us monthly, they make out a check and they send it every month to the Forest Park Church of Christ. And that goes to our elders. They oversee the receipt of it and the accounting of it. And we're required to work with them in that. 
And so we've, we have talked with them and let them know what our needs are. And they're in agreement to those needs and us raising those funds. We want to thank you for caring enough to help out. That didn't happen because of one person. We know when you had your contributions this morning under the direction of your elders, it was decided what they would send, the bills they would pay, and the money that they would give. And so in good conscience, we can say that it is you that is enabling the work to be done. And we're never, we never want to forget that. We know how important that that is to God's work. We want to thank you from the bottom of our heart. We would be certainly amiss if we did not tonight tell you how urgent the gospel message is. It's most urgent right here tonight for you and for me. If there's anything in our life that separates us from the gospel of Jesus Christ, this is our opportunity to see that we get that out of our life. To repent of the wrongdoing as a Christian, we're commanded in the Scriptures to repent of wrongdoing and pray to God to forgive us, and He will do it. He'll give us a new start. And if we've not ever obeyed the gospel, you know the Bible, it speaks so plainly that this is the day of salvation. Susie Kofi saw that in Funafuti Tuvalu in late 1989. Even walking out among the sharks that were swimming around her, she was baptized into Christ. And that was over 30 years ago, still a faithful woman who loves the Lord. If there's someone here tonight who has never obeyed the gospel and you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Scriptures say that you must repent. You must turn away from that which is wrong and confess Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The Bible goes on to say that you would need to be immersed down into the water and not remain there certainly, but to be raised back up. Why? To walk in a new life. And that was the most wonderful time in my life when I came up from that water. My sins were forgiven. And if you've never obeyed the gospel, the Bible says yours too would be forgiven if you obeyed that message. Today is the day of salvation, literally for all of us. And so my prayer is that if you have a need, we think that that's a much more important need than what I've spoken to you about today. It's much more urgent as you walk out that door and return to your home. You're among people who love you, and we want to help you. God bless you for your good attention tonight. I noticed that your, your eyes have gotten big. I don't know if it was because I mentioned a lot of money or it was the sharks, but I want to thank you. And your ears have grown some. And uh, some of you already had good-sized ears to start, and now you've really got them. But I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for your undivided attention. And I appreciate your gracious extension of your time and being here together with you this evening. I know that we have a song of invitation that's been chosen for us, and um, I believe it's a good opportunity for us to invite you to stand as we sing this song of invitation. Freedom we all hold dear, now is at stake. Humming your hearts to God, safe from the chastening rod. Seek the way, pilgrims draw, Christians awake. Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Many will meet their doom. Trumpets will sound. All of the dead shall rise. Righteous meet in the sky. Going where no one dies. Heavenward bound. Troubles will soon be o'er. Happy forevermore. When we meet on that shore. Free from all care. Rising up in the sky, telling this world goodbye. Homeward we then will fly, glory to share. 
Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Many will meet their doom, trumpets will sound. All of the dead shall rise, righteous meet in the sky. Going where no one dies, heavenward bound. If you weren't able to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, you can go to the door on my right, and Grant will help you out with that. We're going to sing um, number seven, and then we'll have our closing prayer. We'll sing just the first verse. Abide with me, fast falls the eventide, the darkness deepens, Lord with me abide, when other helpers fail. Help of the helpless, so oh, abide with me. As always, it's just great to have Randy and Sharon here. We love you so much and appreciate you so much. And just want the congregation to know how much Ray and Billy and I support just 100% the things that uh, their work, and we are anxious to help with this effort for PBN. We'll be getting information uh, back and forth. We really appreciate Jerry. as He's a deacon that helps with uh, Randy. And we'll try to get some numbers, um, see if we can have a special contribution or something. Some of those plans just aren't done yet. But we're going to make this happen. I know you will. Um, we trust you 100%. And um, let's all kind of gather our thoughts together and uh, pray together about this. Our Father in heaven, we know that we even mentioned a verse in Adam's class this morning about how we are fellow workers with God, fellow workers with, with him. And that is a, a comforting thought to know that uh, our work is with our Father as well as for our Father in heaven. And uh, that was a, a neat thing that the Apostle Paul said to us to encourage us and help us to think about that. We, uh, we pray for uh, Randy and Sharon and their family. Pray for Randy as he plans these things and activities and, and leads them and um, as as Christians gather our funds together, um, we're anxious and encouraged and excited uh, to think about what uh, the future may hold there. And if if just one person turned on a radio or clicked on a on a a website or did something to learn about their Savior, uh, that would that would be a lot. And and we know how many souls have uh, already started being reached. We pray that that continues. We pray you'd bless the work. And we ask you to uh, uh, keep Randy and Sharon in good health, uh, keep them energetic, and uh, thank you so much for what they mean in our lives. We love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.